Uh, while uh, Troy is getting the slides up, uh, the see that the uh, title I have here is Bible versus Science. Do I have to choose? And if you listen to the media, if you attend a secular school, and I don't just mean college, <laughs> I mean high school, middle school, elementary school, etc. They will tell you that, yep, you got to choose one or the other. Bible or science, pick one. You can be blind faith or you can follow the science. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Nevertheless, it's good to set the stage to see where I'm coming from and then hopefully to uh, provide some encouragement and uh, breaking with our normal procedure, I'm going to end a little bit early, I hope, <laughs> uh, in order to provide an opportunity for some questions and answers, which could be questions about science that you've always wondered about, how does the Bible square with such and such, uh, or it could be questions that you've heard, um, your friends, family, colleagues, co-workers, uh, skeptics that you've encountered who have expressed some doubts about the uh, validity of the Bible or its ability to comport with science. So keep that in mind. Anyway, for a very long time, we have been inundated with exactly the same message. The universe is really, really old and they get all happy about being able to add another significant figure onto the age. It was 13.8 billion years up until recently, and then they did some more experiments, and now they're saying, nope, 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 we've refined it. It's 13.77 billion years old. Now, to you, you may say, I don't care. 13.8 and 13.77 sounds like the same thing to me, but to a scientist, that is a big deal to add another significant figure. All right. Well, they're going to tell us that the Earth is four and a half billion years old. They're going to tell us that the dinosaurs lived between 65 and 250 million years ago. Do we get a theme here? Everything's really, really old. What about humans? Oh, well, supposedly fire records show that uh, cultural diffusion took off 400,000 years ago. Oh, and then they discovered this. Some supposedly extinct ancestor of humans that are supposedly our closest relative. And they lived some several hundred thousand years ago. Now, I could spend hours listing this. We've all been having to deal with it since we were this tall. The message has been around many, many, many decades. So the bottom line is, what's a believer supposed to do in the face of all this science? Now, this is what some folks have tried to do. Hey, let's change the public school curricula to consider the strengths and weaknesses of the theory of evolution. Have you heard of this thing called intelligent design? Now, don't get me wrong, there was an intelligent designer of the universe. <laughs> that's, that's clear. However, this movement was an idea started in the late 80s. And the idea was that if you look at evolution in general and you go back and you start to see, and they, they developed ideas, which I agree with, uh, things like irreducible complexity, that evolution just can't explain this. Now, it turns out that's actually correct, but what they tried to do is say, well, look, if you look at this just neutrally, 
No, 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 don't look at it from a, from a, from a you know, religious perspective or what. Just follow the evidence and look at it, and you will come to the conclusion that it couldn't possibly have come together on its own. And they'll get into details about the DNA and about protein structures and the ability of abiogenesis and blah, 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 and all sorts of interesting stuff. And the idea is that, look, if you just follow the evidence, you will come to a conclusion, or it is reasonable at least, to come to a conclusion that there was an intelligent designer. Now, some creationists who are also scientists have some interesting things to say about this. Now, if the name Henry Morris doesn't ring a bell to you, he and Pastor Hickson's professor, John Wickham, wrote the book The Genesis Flood in the early 1960s, which essentially started the modern era of creation science, looking at creation from a scientific perspective. He had this to say, strong movement among evangelicals uh, today to emphasize intelligent design as the argument of choice against naturalism, the idea that everything came together on its own from mass and energy, as the argument of choice uh, okay, in evolution. But this approach, even if well-meaning and effectively articulated, very, very bright people involved, will not work. It has been often tried in the past and failed. It will fail today. The reason it won't work is because it is not based on the Bible. Now, another group, which is actually uh, located in northern, northern Kentucky near Cincinnati, uh, they have the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter and all that. Answers in Genesis. Same idea here. Despite incorporating some extremely bright thinkers, the movement as a whole seems to have recurring philosophical blind spot. Though they often correctly point out the religious foundations of Darwinism, the fact that all scientific reasoning is ultimately based on presuppositions, which are unprovable and hence biased by definition, should have alerted them to the fact that there is no such thing as a neutral scientific arena within which to interpret the evidence related to the past. I'm going to get into this a little bit more in a moment. But the idea that there is a neutral area and just look at the evidence and you'll come to what the conclusion you come to is a fallacy that is not true. And remember, in 1999, 1999, Henry Morris predicted that the intelligent design movement was going to fail. They made great efforts trying to put it into the public school system, not to get rid of evolution, but for the simple idea that, look, there's more than one way to look at this. The evolutionists have one way of looking at it. Creation people have another way of looking at it. Creation has reasonable scientific basis to it. And that's all intelligent design was trying to do. They were just trying to get creation, intelligent design, as an alternative, a viable alternative, into the public school system so that students could see both choices. That's all they tried to do. Henry Moore said, eh, it's going to fail. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. This thing went through the courts, and what did the judge say? Intelligent design is a religious view. It's not scientific theory. Now, that's not the case, but, but when you realize that everything is evaluated from your presuppositions, then a secular court is going to come to this conclusion. Henry Morris predicted that six years earlier. Now, one of the people who has most eloquently articulated this is uh, Jason Lyle, who was here on campus last year and spoke. Uh, his book, The Ultimate Proof of Creation, I'm drawing some from that tonight. Uh, you can see uh, spe speeches he's made on this on YouTube. Very, very well done. And his point is the following, that both 
the folks who come to the conclusion that there is a creator, or the folks that come to the conclusion that naturalism and evolution is the only uh, sensible conclusion, both of them are looking at the same set of evidence. Cre some folks in the creation community will think that there is a set of evidence that is just irrefutable. You, all you have to do is find the right set of evidence and there's just no doubt about it. Nobody could reasonably come to any other conclusion than that there is a creator. That's not true. <laughs> the, the heart, the human heart is hard and you can present mountains of evidence and they still won't believe. Now, there's a whole other topic and it's called the philosophy of science which sounds like an oxymoron, right? <laughs> it's like, make up your mind. Either you're a scientist or a philosopher. No, there's actually a field of study called the philosophy of science. And part of it is that, and most of the public is unaware of this, and a lot of scientists are unaware of this, that again, your ability to interpret evidence turns out to be driven by your worldview. You say, I don't have a worldview. Yep, you do. You just don't even know it. So, the secular folks have their presuppositions, the biblical folks have their presuppositions, and again, the idea is that if you try to think that there is a neutral ground, that you can say, well, we'll just look at the, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll leave all of our worldviews behind, we'll just look at the evidence, and we'll draw our conclusions. Uh, the seculars already won the battle. The moment you agree to that, you have lost the battle. And it's, of course, we're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to win the human heart, right? The whole point of this is to make people, or not make, but to encourage people to investigate the Bible, the truth claims of the Bible, so that the, you know, the Holy Spirit can lead them into the truth. That's the whole point here. We're not trying to win an argument. And so the moment you drop the Bible and say, oh, we'll just look at this, the evidence neutrally, you've already lost. Now, getting back to uh, the current vitriol, it's not getting any better. Look at this. Creationism isn't about science, it's about theology, and it's really bad theology. All right, well, how about this one? Intelligent design creationism. Fraudulent science, bad philosophy. It's not enough for them to say that, that, no, we think naturalism is the right answer. No, no, no. They also have to attack the, the whole thing. They, they recognize that there is a worldview behind it, and they, they, they can't just agree to disagree. They have to attack it. Now, if you don't think that's demonically driven, you need to reread some sections of Scripture <laughs> because in practically any other arena, you can find folks that will agree to disagree and they'll debate and they'll go back and forth and they'll have a good time and then they go out and watch sports or whatever. Not with this one. Uh-uh. You are not allowed to have another opinion. If it's not atheist, naturalist, evolution... You're a dangerous idiot who may influence our children. Here's something. You've heard of Wikipedia. This thing is called Rational Wiki. And it is put together by some of the most ardent atheists you've ever seen. Look, they refer to creationism as the divine comedy. And running gags, biblical literalism, intelligent design, creation scientists. These folks are not hiding the fact that they don't just disagree with you. They think you are an idiot who probably doesn't even deserve to live. Maybe going a little bit far, but you get the idea. Now, if you say, well, that's just one crackpot with a website. Eh, not really. Look at this. British edition of the Huffington Post. 2014, creationism myth, they've already decided that's a fact, 
Creation is a myth believed by a staggering number of, of Americans. We can't believe this number, this percentage of Americans that believe in the flying purple spaghetti monster, which is what they're equating creationism with. Right? It's like, well, no, 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 no sane, rational person would believe in the flying spaghetti monster. That's what they're equating creationism with. Now, this was 2014. They were just couldn't believe the staggering number of people who believed the creation myth. Seven years later, which is now, this came out last week. With higher levels of education, declining religiosity, most Americans now accept evolution. This might be a little bit small, but... Data shows that Americans were really divided in the 80s through the 2000s. Over the last decade, however, the percentage of American adults who agreed with the statement that life came through evolution uh, increased from 40 to 54 percent. What's their conclusion? Oh, we got more smart people now. Mm hmm. Okay. Religious fundamentalism, identified in the study as the strongest factor leading to rejection of evolution. Look here. Even though the population of Americans who identify as fundamentalists declined in the last decade, some 30% remain committed to their beliefs. You can, you can hear the, the tone of voice. 30% of them are still committed. According to, uh, you know what kind of committed they're thinking of. According to the study, those who scored highest on the scale of religious fundamentalism shifted towards acceptance of rev evolution, rising from 8% in 1988 to 32% in 2019. These are people who supposedly are religious fundamentalists. Now, it's not terribly surprising we're getting this shift. It's starting in the schools, which admittedly is why the intelligent design movement got started 40 years ago, 35 years ago. 60% spike in class time devoted to evolution in the last 12 years. In 2007, 51% biology teachers emphasized theory of evolution as broad consensus. That same percentage in 2000. Seven gave no credence to creationism, but 12 years later, the number of teachers teaching that evolution has broad consensus to be fact and not giving credence to creationism has risen to 67%. So, this is becoming popular. Your great 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 grandfather was an amoeba or something even a lower life form. There's no difference between us and chimps and whales and cows and bananas and bacteria. We just happen to be on the branch that got a little further along. That's what's popular now. And this is not. This is not popular anymore. Why? Why? We know the schools obviously have an influence. Why? Look at that. Record no low number of Americans hold a biblical world view. Now, the folks that did this, Arizona Christian University, I believe, Barna Research Group, they went deeper than just saying, are you a Christian? Or are you a believer in the, uh, you know, the idea of you know, Jesus came to earth, died for, for your sins, rose again, is your, your savior? They went deeper than that. They actually asked questions to see how people behaved. Does it influence your life from day to day? And they ask questions to determine whether or not these folks were living in a way that was consistent with what they claimed, which was that they were Christians. And it turns out, most people aren't. Only 
of Americans have a biblical world view. Born again Christians, three times more likely to have a biblical worldview. However, the fact that not quite one out of five born again adults holds a biblical worldview highlights the extensive decline of corporate Christian principles in America over the last several decades. I have a problem with anybody who says we live in a Christian nation. The societal shift towards non-Christian worldviews uh, is clearly reflected in the values. Citing previous research, Barner went on to talk about that the dominant values in the United States today are acceptance, comfort, control, entertainment, entitlement, experiences, expression, freedom, and happiness. That's what everybody wants now. Me, 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 my, 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 good, good, good. Those contemporary values highlight the profound contrast from previous eras in which a more widely accepted biblical worldview yielded civic duty, hard work, humility, faith, family, moderation, and the rule of law. Now, if I haven't completely convinced you of the status of things in America, and I think I asked Troy to hold this to himself last week, catch this. The president of the group of chaplains at Harvard is an atheist. Let that one sink in for a minute. Now, I do have to admit, I didn't even know cha Harvard had chaplains. <laughs> uh, probably a holdover from their roots <laughs> way back. And there's a couple dozen of them, several dozen of them from all sorts of different perspectives and worldviews. But the person they elected as their leader is an atheist. Okay, you've completely blown my mind now. So this guy who authored the book Good Without God, non-religious people do believe what non-religious people do believe. Um, well, look, look, look. Should we expect anything different? Look here. 2017 at Harvard, 32% of the incoming freshmen identified as atheist or agnostic. Just two years later, that was up to 38%. In two years. Yeah, you're going to have an atheist chaplain. One third of your student body thinks there isn't a God. Where are they going to go when life gets difficult? This is the book he wrote. About 10, 11 years ago. Good without God. This is humanism. This is the worship of man. And of course, we know that that doesn't go well. But, catch this. Both the fellow that's the president and the fellow that he uh, dedicated the book to are Jewish. And, look at this. The guy that he dedicated the book to is a rabbi, was. The song of humanistic Judaism. Can Satan mess this up anymore? I'm sure he can, but I don't want to know about it. It's bad enough as it is. Look at this song. Where is my light? My light is in me. Where is my hope? My hope is in me. Where is my strength? My strength is in me. And in you. How are we going to get through this? We'll get through it together. Just, just you and me. That works really well if you're in a nice, comfy, cushy home with enough food to eat and friends and, and uh, nobody's shooting at you. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to turn your back on God when, uh, when you're living in the uh, creature comforts of uh, our modern society. All right, so the statistics in the news are alarming, but let's get back to the uh, let's get back to the topic at hand. Does a Bible believer have to commit intellectual suicide? 
That's where I come in. I have titled the remainder of this talk, The Most Reluctant Young Earth Creationist, because I'm talking about me. Now, if you know C.S. Lewis, you know that I have uh, liberally borrowed the title from him in his book, uh, Surprised by Joy, where he talks about his conversion. Uh, he, he didn't want to be a believer. He didn't want to be a Christian. And if you read his conversion story, what you find out is that he tried everything he could to avoid <laughs> becoming a Christian, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him go. And finally, he says, okay, when I finally knelt and prayed, I was perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. You've heard the, you've heard the testimonies where somebody gets saved and it's like, it's like all of a sudden, you know, their burdens are lifted and life is wonderful. And that's cool. That's absolutely great. I and mean, that's wonderful when God delivers somebody from, from just horrendous burdens in their situation. Obviously, we know God does that. That was not the case with Lewis. And he pointed out the fact that, look, I, I was looking for anything other than God to satisfy me. You know, and he, 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 he likened it to, you know, some cornered animal that was eyes were di darting in various different directions looking for an escape path. He didn't want to be a Christian, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let go. So anyway, he was the most reluctant, uh, called himself the most reluctant convert. Well, I'm calling myself a most reluctant young earth creationist because it took me a while to get there. Briefly. How'd this all start? Well, I grew up in, a, in a, uh, a family of believers. But, uh, you know, real serious Bible study wasn't, wasn't super important. I mean, we read the Bible, attended church, you know, uh, participated, whatnot. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to disparage my parents, but, but you know, concerted uh, study through the entire Bible wasn't of major focus. So, at some point, I get into junior high, high school, I think it was junior high, encounter my first life science class, and I encounter the first time that I was dealing with a teacher who was talking about evolution. I'd certainly heard about it before, but I'd never had to, uh, never had to deal with it from perspective of learning it, and putting it back on a test, and things like that. So, I go home, and I talked to my parents about this. And I said, well, what do, you, what do you think about this? And they said, they, they had a quick answer. They said, basically, well, you know, if, if the scientists say that everything started with the Big Bang, no problem. God just spoke the Big Bang into existence. Fine, everything's cool. And then I said, and I can't remember if that was at the time or a, a bit later, somewhere along the line, I said, well, okay, but what about Adam and Eve? How does that show up in this evolutionary time frame, timeline? My parents were not, not uh, bothered by that in the least. They, uh, you know, they looked at that a little bit and they said, well, I mean, they, basically they admitted they didn't know for sure, but uh, they said, well, you know, maybe, maybe Adam and Eve were the first humans that God put a soul into, and that's how it all started. And at that point, I had other things to occupy my time, and I said, well, okay, I guess I can live with that. Moving on. So, didn't think a whole lot about it. I got involved in the youth group at my church, which was by far one of the best things that ever happened to me, because that is when I started taking the Bible more seriously. Devotions, quiet times, Bible study, fellowship, all that stuff. So that was good. And then something interesting happens. You remember the quote before about, well, if you're educated, then, you know, you're going to basically believe science and evolution? Well, I beg to differ. I went to college, and I started to realize that evolution was nonsense. I started getting exposed to the folks who were shedding light on all of the holes and the problems and the things that the evolutionists don't want to talk about. And, you know, and I started growing in my appreciation for the fact that 
evolution isn't as open, as closed as they would lead us to believe. And as I went on, that awareness, that understanding grew more and more. I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for that in a moment. So by the time I go into uh, early middle age, I'm now what you would call an old earth creationist. At this point, I have become utterly convinced that evolution is just complete nonsense. But I hadn't heard anybody talk about the geology aspect and the astrophysics aspect of this stuff. And admittedly, I hadn't really looked into it that much. So I had been exposed to lots and lots of teaching about the flaws and, and issues with evolution, but not much about uh, age of the earth, age of the universe, that kind of thing. So if, it, and, and that's effectively what I became. It's like, well, okay, the, the earth is really old, and, but all the life came together because God spoke it into existence and all that. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, fine. Well, look at this. I, I distinctly remember the day when a colleague passed me, I think it was in the parking lot, and he just casually mentioned that his church group had gone to the Creation Museum you know, over near Cincinnati. And I, I smiled and nodded my head, and I'm ashamed to admit this now, but remember, I was just giving the the uh, secularists a hard time about looking down on the creationists. Well, that's kind of the way I was thinking about my colleague. It's like, it's like really, you, you, think the, you, you think the earth is only 6,000 years old? It's like, really? It was coming from a position of ignorance. I had not looked into it, and I was buying into the party line. 13.8 billion years old universe, five, four and a half billion year old Earth, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay, so what about now? Well, we'll get to that here in a moment, quickly. So what does the Bible have to say? Well, of course, it's the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the Earth. No, even, even old earth creationists believe that. That's, that's not the controversial part. What does John say? In the beginning was the word. Okay, well, we're all good with that. Now, in Hebrews, faith is the confidence of what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. And then a couple verses later, oops, Uh, by faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. It's hard to appreciate how radical that statement was, much less is now. He's stating that, look, God can create something out of nothing. Whereas naturalism says, uh-uh, there's been mass and energy forever, and somehow where along the line it big banged and all the rest of that stuff. See, the, the naturalists, they're religious too. They just don't know it. They have this belief that there was this point of infinite mass density that existed for eternity, and somewhere along the line went bang, and then everything else happened. They're religious. They just don't know it and don't acknowledge it. It's like, which takes more faith? There was this point of infinite mass density. Well, where did that come from? They have no idea. God created it. Well, where did God come from? He's eternally existent. Well, all that just sidesteps the question. No, it doesn't. Something has to have existed for eternity in order for anything to exist. I know it hurts your head, but that's the way it is. But is it blind faith? See, that's what they accuse us of. Oh, you radical believers, you Bible thumpers, eh, you just, you just, you're just blind faith. You got this book and you just blindly believe it. Sorry, that's not true. I keep 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So our belief is based on evidence that is properly interpreted by the enablement of the Holy Spirit. Remember John chapter 20. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Why did John write the book? He told us. He was one of the few authors that actually told us why he wrote the book. I'm writing this stuff down that you may believe. Our faith is based on evidence. You know, eyewitness testimony, revelation by God, various things. It's all part of the Word, which, of course, we know was eternally existent in Jesus. But our faith is not blind. We didn't just wake up someday and say, oh, well, I believe, you know. No, it's based on evidence. So, Steve set this up for me great this morning uh, when he talked about 1 Corinthians. Uh, so I'll just skip to the good part down here. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things. Not just spiritual things, not just religious things, not just moral things. All things. Including science. Okay? So... What are the implications of these verses when we consider the majority view of the scientific establishment regarding the origins of life and the universe? Well, the question is, is what we see here, is it primary or derivative? Sounds like a fancy term. Well, all I'm saying is, did the mass always exist or was it created? Now, the naturalists, they're not sorry, naturalists, the folks who follow naturalism, uh, they will say only mass and energy are primary. Again, this point of infinite mass density just sat there for eternity and then somehow decided to go bang. That's what they believe. And then the reductionists will say everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. Wow. I remember when my cat died, and I was in mourning for a week, and that's tiny compared to losing a relative. That has nothing to do with physics and chemistry, I can tell you that right now. All right, so a couple of thought experiments. What does that look like? This is the audience participation part. Looks like an A, yeah. No, 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 that's just random marks in the sand. Well, maybe. How about that one? Were those random marks in the sand? There is not a person on the face of the earth who still has their mental faculties who would say those are random marks. Now, hold that thought for a moment. Dr. Werner Gitt, who's a physicist in Germany, developed this idea called universal information theory, uh, and the idea that information is a non-material entity. And his point is that you have to have information to do all sorts of things, primarily to have life, and to have life that begets life. You have to have information, you have to have some kind of what do you want to call it, software, code, whatever. But it's got, to, it's got to be information. And he has written multiple books on the topic, and the conclusion is pretty simple. The source of universal information is always an intelligent agent. There is not one single documented case of real information, not just some random strokes on a typewriter, there's not one single documented case of real information coming together all by itself. It always has an intelligent agent as a source. Oh, that sounds a little funny. It's a person. <laughs> yes, God in the case of, crea of, of our creation. Now, what's the most complex storage mechanism of universal information? Everybody agrees it's DNA. 
the human DNA has more than three billion letters. And even the simplest single-celled organism has tens of thousands of letters. The simplest single-celled organism has tens of thousands of letters in its DNA. Now, we just agreed that those seven marks in the sand that happened to spell Michael could not possibly have come about by accident. And yet, the evolutionists want us to believe that DNA just somehow all came together by itself. Now, I'm skipping over some stuff about how do you create proteins and blah, 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 and, you know, the creation scientists have gotten into that. The more they get into it, the more they show that it's, based, you know, it's impossible for this stuff to come about on its own. However, if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you'll probably come to a different conclusion. All right, so life could not exist without both material and non-material entities. This idea that it all started with the Big Bang doesn't float, just doesn't float. Now, as I wrap up, uh, let's look at some more data from the Bible. And I use that word purposely, data from the Bible. Have you ever looked at these lifespans and wondered, how did that drop off? We've got... You know, by the time you're around, you know, King David, yeah, people are living kind of like about what we do. Pre-flood, people are living eight, nine hundred years. And there's this transition in between. How's that working? Well, very briefly, talk about this concept of genetic entropy. It's too bad Beth Elbers isn't here because she loaned me, within the span of a couple months, she loaned me the book, the pastor told me about the book, and a professional colleague told me about the book. It's like, I better, I think God's trying to get my attention. I need to read this book. So I did, and his catchphrase is, it's down, not up. In other words, things are devolving, not evolving. And the data proves it. So, the primary axiom of biological evolution is that life forms become more complex over time due to random mutations and natural selection. Errors in the copying process of the DNA happen from time to time, and that's true, that does happen. Uh, and, then, and then, you know, the, 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 the strong survives and the weak dies off. That's the idea. Sounds like it works, but what does, I mean, it sounds reasonable, but what does the data actually show? Well, this is the naive and false view of mutations. When they came up with evolution, well, of course, Darwin predated some of the you know, stuff we know about genetics now, but, uh, but even, even as genetic theory got developed, people had this false idea that 50% of the mutations were good and 50% of the mutations were bad. Well, if you go talk to a population geneticist, they're going to say, uh-uh, that's what it looks like. Now, what does this complicated graph mean? It means that 99.999 whatever percent of the mutations are deleterious. There's this tiny percentage of mutations that help. Most of those are so small that at the reproductive level, you can't even tell the difference. And the couple that m might actually help and help with reproduction, they get completely swamped out by the accumulation of the bad ones. So this is details of the different ways things can uh, get you know, messed up in the, in the genes of the cells. And what he shows is that, well, all right, here's a theoretical curve. Fitness, think of it as healthiness on the y-axis, and then generations, meaning, you know, beget, 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 that kind of thing, uh, on the x-axis. And what it's saying is that if you have a 1% accumulation of uh, the mutations, then... Um, you, you get this decline in fitness as generations go on. 
in the human population, 300 generations is in the range of six to 9,000 years. All right, well, that's a, that's a nice little theoretical curve. This is showing that if you have 100 mutations per person per generation, population size of 10,000, one in 1,000 beneficial mutations, here's the relative mutation count over time. The deleterious mutations just keep accumulating generation to generation to generation. You say, okay, and again, fitness decline. This is a simulation using realistic human mutation rate. They took all of the science about how mutations actually occur in humans, and then they stuck it into a computer model, and it says, okay, healthiness, fitness declines generation to generation. Okay, well, those are cool simulation results. I'm from Missouri. Show me the data. What does the data show? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is real data. Now, in order to help get a whole bunch of generations into a reasonable period of time, they look at things like viruses. Now, this book came out before COVID, so I don't know what he thinks about the current situation. But they were looking at things like H1N1. And what they showed is, sure enough, the mutations accumulate generation to generation. That's what the genetic data shows. And how about fitness decline? How about you know, reduced healthiness generation to generation? And sure enough, you get this now to a scientist, mathematician, engineer, you see this exponential decay function, which is well known within math and science. And sure enough, the data actually follows it. H1N1, H2N2, H3N2. They've looked at multiple different viruses and it follows what the theory says that the fitness declines. You say, okay, and your point is, well, let's go back to that data from the Bible. Keep that in mind. Now look at that. This is the lifespan in years of those folks in the Bible, plus two others. This is King David. This is the average lifespan of a person during the, a certain period in the Roman Empire. Real data. And what do you know? It follows that exponential decay function, and it does so with a fit of 96%. Now, if you're not as much of a geek as I am, this graph may not do much for you. This was the graph that turned me into a young Earth creationist. When I saw this graph, the Holy Spirit used that to say, Mike, you can trust Genesis 1 through 11. Because, think about, think about that decay. No, nobody, nobody, nobody knew about this genetic uh, mutation accumulation stuff for 4,000 years later, or something like that. And the mathematics of exponential decay didn't get invented for a few thousand years either. You could not have invented this data. You can't. And yet, it fits science like a glove. This is the chart that turned me into a young Earth creationist. Now you say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> that has to do with humans. What about the age of the Earth? Okay. Well, so, old Earth creationist to young Earth creationist. So, oops, back up. So, upon further investigation, this, this is what motivated me to start looking at the science of age of the Earth, age of the universe, that kind of thing. And what do you know? That science has holes in it too, <laughs> in terms of how old the Earth is. So, you know, the, the science for the old Earth is not nearly as solid as we would have been led to believe. And there's some great examples. There's carbon-14 in diamonds, which 
is an unstable element, has a half-life of about 5,600 years, should have completely died out after, oh, say, 100,000 years or something like that, and yet they find it in diamonds that they say are billions of years old. Sorry, that's inconsistent. Okay, well, what about comets? Well, we know comets are dirty ice balls, or icy dirt balls, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and those beautiful tails that we see when we get a chance to see a comet, what is that? That's the force of the sun and the solar wind, you know, causing material from the comet to basically stream off. It's the comet dying is what it is. And the scientists will tell you, yeah, the average comet can only live about 100,000 years. Now, okay, if that's the case, how can the universe be 14 billion years old? How can our solar system be four and a half billion years old when we've got these comets out there that you're telling me can only be 100, 000, you know, will die within 100,000 years? You want to know what their answer is? The Oort cloud. They have invented a comet generator. They say, way out beyond the solar system, beyond our ability to make any observations, there's something out there that causes comets to grow. Well, how do you know this? Do you have any data? No. Well, then how do you know that's the case? Well, it has to be because the Earth is four and a half billion years old. There must be a comet generator out there. Do you see how you, 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 you can't win that argument? It's a worldview perspective. But remember how we started here. My point is that if you are uncomfortable thinking that science disagrees with the Bible, you just need to dig into the science a little more and you'll find out, nope, that's not the case. All right, well, but, but wait a minute. What about the fossils? What about the dinosaurs? What about radiometric dating? You know, what about the distant starlight problem? But, 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 but. There's all sorts of details that you can get into, and frankly, I find most of this fascinating. And if anybody wants to talk about it after church or some other time, I'm delighted to meet with you. There are plenty of resources out there. The web is a wonderful thing in this regard. Answers in Genesis, Biblical Science Institute, Creation Astronomy, Feed My Sheep Foundation. All of these places will be, give you lots and lots and lots of information, data, research, all, all sorts of stuff that talks about why a young Earth, young universe, is perfectly reasonable scientifically. Now, does it really matter? And I've gotten this question from believers. Say, oh, okay, fine, you've become a young Earth creationist. I get it. I'm a believer. I don't think the origins question is that important. What do you say? Well, oh, where is it? It's right here. The most stinging rebuke of old earth creationism I found was generated by a diehard atheist. Another one of these bloggers. Look what he says. Oh, they especially want their rather idolatrous version of the Bible's mythology to be true because all of their biggest threats, oh, you're going to hell. You know, that's what, that's what they, they just view God as this cosmic killjoy. Their biggest threats hinge upon it being literally true. No literal Genesis means no literal Adam, means no literal fall, means Jesus didn't have to fix anything. Oh, maybe there's no literal hell either. Whoops, oh, it's all gone. In a puff of smoke, in a puff of logic, the whole Bible and, and Christianity disappears. Well, I beg to differ. This is precisely why Genesis 1 through 11 is important. If we can trust that Genesis 1 is an accurate account, not poetry, not symbolic, what I've tried to hint at is that, yes, you can, you can absolutely believe that, then there are some profound implications, such as God created humans, male and female. Adam and Eve were the first humans. There was a literal fall. The Messiah was promised. There was a flood. I didn't even have time to get into that. Uh, that was what? A precursor to the final judgment. 
Oh, and the builders of the Tower of Babel set in place a worldview that spawned all of the false religions that we're plagued with to this day. You think Genesis 1 through 11 is not important? You're not reading it carefully. So, don't believe the lie. The Bible is trustworthy. It does not contradict science. There's no need to allegorize the non-poetical sections that appear to disagree with science. And you do not have to commit intellectual suicide to believe the Bible. Thanks. Questions?